credit cards in order for credit card businesses to make sense and to flourish, they need people to revolve. They need people to miss payments. And I don't think that's a good business. Credit cards will have a place going forward. Right. Sure. I, I don't think BNPL is going to replace it. I think there's a whole ecosystem of products which are coming up. We're seeing adoption of close to 30 to 40 percent on any merchant that we launch with. Right. Um, compared to uh, any other payment method in the market, this is uh, the, the, the speed at which we got there is pretty incredible. So the traction has been pretty incredible. Uh, the usage in store has been very strong. Um, I think it's just down to the fact that it is a very a seamless experience for the customer. I want to welcome you to the second season of Couchonomics with Arjun. Join us this season as we go beyond fintech and payments and embark on the journey into the future of financial services, a future which will be shaped by existing and new developments in technology and innovation, including and not limited to the likes of embedded finance, open banking, ESG, various versions of metaverse, decentralized finance, digital currencies, and other trends. On the couch, we're going to have the most influential and progressive-minded founders, executives, investors, regulators, innovators, and industry commentators from across the MENA region and beyond. Join us as we unravel a multitude of layers of the financial services industry and try to learn how technology will continue to impact the world that we live in. Couchonomics with Arjun is proud to collaborate with some of the most respected and innovative names in the world of payments, fintech, and technology. Audion is a reliable end-to-end -end payment solution that provides innovation and flexibility to help businesses achieve their ambition faster by turning payments into a strategic growth driver. Get everything you need with Tuyu, a Saudi-based super app for delivery, mobility, on-demand services, and a lot more. Tuyu connects you to everything you need to enrich your daily lives by building an ecosystem across its end consumers, merchants, and reps. Visa is a world leader in digital payments with a mission to connect the world through the most innovative, convenient, reliable, and secure payments network to enable individuals, businesses, and economies to thrive. GDA is a leading fintech and payment solution provider founded in Saudi Arabia expanding rapidly across the region with established operations in UAE and Egypt. GDS vision is to empower merchants with the tools to start, manage and grow their business. M2P pioneers next-gen fintech through innovative offerings across payments, lending and banking landscapes. Their comprehensive tech stack powers end-to-end -end banking services, BNPL, customized credit cards, prepaid cards and more. So hello all, welcome to season two. Uh, it's our first episode of the, the season. Um, we had a great season one uh, and I wanted to thank all the listeners, the viewers um, and, and the well-wishers. Uh, I really appreciate all the good comments and feedback that we've received between the two seasons. Our launch of this season is going to focus on a topic which is trending across the world. It's called embedded finance. But to make it more interesting, I'm actually going to focus on uh, what I refer to the naughty poster child of embedded finance, BNPL. And I can't think of anyone better uh, than Mr. BNPL himself, Hossam Arab, who's joined me in the studio and on the couch. Hossam is a friend first and foremost. He's also the co-founder and CEO of Tabby which is one of the largest and fastest growing BNPL player uh, in the region. Uh, they operate across uh, the UAE, the kingdom, and Egypt. So, Hassam, welcome to the couch. Thank you for having me. I know you love this. I do. Right? Absolutely. Uh, uh, for the viewers who don't know, uh, I've had to practically drag and, 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 and sort of tie him to the couch. Uh, it's taken me about 12 months of, 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 of hard work to get him there. I'm here finally. You are, you are <laughs> finally here in person, right? Uh, now that you have sort of made it here, 
um, there's a lot that I want to unpack about the BNPL sector, right? And and I've got a whole host of topics that I want to cover. I want to start about, you know, the current macro environment that we're in and what it really <clears> means uh, for BNPL. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the emergence of what we have... Uh, what we all are calling lending 3.0. Um, what do you see as the future of BNPL? Um, and what are the playbooks which are sort of emerging both globally and regionally? Um, what What do you think the competitive landscape in this market will look like? Uh, and last but not least, very interested to share the story of Tabby to date and sort of where it goes from here. So let's dive straight in. Uh, for my viewers, uh, guys, buckle in. There's going to be a lot of insightful, interesting, analytical conversation today. Uh, and I'm fairly confident that that at the end of this uh, episode, which I do believe will uh, run over the usual 35 minutes, uh, you will have learned a lot about this sector. What's the state of the nation from a BNPL perspective? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, thanks uh, for having me again, uh, Arjun. Um, so uh, listen, where, where BNPL is uh, right now, and it's moved quite uh, uh, rapidly uh, over the last couple of years, where it really went from being the poster child of, of finance and, um, and you know in the venture space, and um, every investor wanted to be in the, in there, uh, to where we are today, where it really is a forbidden, uh, taboo uh, word in in the uh, in the tech space, right? And um, you know I don't think that where we were three years ago was necessarily right, and I don't think where. Um, the, the overall perception of the space is um, correct today either. So the pendulum uh, has sunk too quickly. Absolutely, right? So definitely somewhere in the middle. I, uh, I definitely don't think that uh, BNPL is the right product for every market. Uh, and there are uh, clearly some markets where BNPL is just not relevant. Um, and the opportunity is not as clear as it is um, in markets like this one, right? So, um, you know, we've seen a number of players uh, suffer significant losses, uh, significant devaluations, um, based on the fact that their market is just not relevant. Um, and, and I think we can get into a bit more uh, detail there. Uh, but I strongly believe in a market like this one, um, where credit penetration is extremely low, especially like Saudi, um, we're really solving a problem. And we're, we're providing access um, to credit to consumers that otherwise don't have it um, and and even in a market like the UAE, where you could say credit card penetration is relatively healthy for large uh, portions of the population, uh, they just don't have that access. And uh, providing an alternative um, to credit cards is is what we're here to do. Um, and for that reason, I, I strongly believe that um, this product is extremely well suited to a market like this one, extremely unsuited for a market like the US or the UK, where everyone and their mother has two or three credit cards. Okay, but let me, let me, let me probe that a little yeah. bit deeper, right? So uh, I think at a theoretical level, I cannot disagree with you, right? It's alternative financing, it's alternative payments, it's blurred the lines. But, 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 but share a little bit about who your customers are. Are your customers actually those people who cannot get credit cards? Or are you, because I'm a, I'm a tabby user, sure. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and fortunate enough, I can afford a few credit yeah, cards, yeah. right? Um, I, I use it because I think I prefer the customer journey, right? Um, I think uh, the, the, the installment plans on a number of credit cards are still very clunky mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in terms of the, the way the process works. And actually, they're more expensive, right? Uh, but are you getting customers who you think are the underserved onto your platform? For sure. So, uh, the, the large majority of our customer base is um, our customers that don't have access to credit cards, right? Um, in Saudi Arabia, 90% of our user base is using debit uh, to repay. In the UAE, over 60% of our user base is using debit to repay as well, right? So um, that customer base does not have access or does not want access uh, to a credit card. Um, and they prefer having full clarity on, on their finances and a product like Buy Now Pay Later just fits. Um, there definitely is that customer that's just like you and, and me and, and, and our wives that just prefers the convenience of um, you know, splitting their payments um, over multiple months at no additional cost. Uh, you know, there, there is that luxury consumer that rather than buying one 
handbag a year is buying now two or three handbags a year. So, so you know, I, I would say the large majority again is that underserved consumer that we're trying to solve for. Uh, but there is also that convenience seeking uh, customer as well that's not insignificant um, in scale. Okay, so hold the question. I'm going to come back to it. So, so this whole concept of are people buying things they don't really need just mm -hmm. because it's convenient? I'll sure. come back yeah. to you. Yeah. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the macros, right? Um, I was reading somewhere uh, before before I sort of came into the studio to record the show. Uh, BNPL in 2021 was uh, approximately a 130 billion dollar market, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's estimated to become a whopping 3.4 trillion dollars uh, by 2030, and I think as a founder, that is uh, well, great news, right? But let's forget about 2030, right? I want to focus more on 2023, okay? Uh, and in my opinion, the macros currently are a mixed bag for BNPL, right? Uh, you have rising interest rates. Um, access to capital is hard, right? Uh, you have a fear of recession. Um, and some people are acknowledging that certain parts of the world are already in recession, right? Uh, cost of living is increasing even in our part of the world here right? Um, there is a slowdown in consumer spending, which is starting to worry, uh, I guess, retailers, and you would know more about it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if this recession is to come around, uh, uh, we are, you know, we obviously worry about job losses and, 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 you know, the implications that might have on the wider sort of credit market, right? So, I'd like you to sort of try and answer this question, if possible, in sort of three levels, right? Mm -hmm. I want your take or I want your read on, you know, the economy by itself. And and we can focus on this part of the world more than, you know, the global economy. The The second aspect is how does this all impact the BNPL sector? Um, and since you guys are pretty much in a position of being market makers, I think, you know, the the the... The, your actions are, are, are going to reflect how the sector might actually respond to it. And then finally, how do you see this all play out from a competitive landscape perspective mm -hmm. in the region? Yeah. So macro is where it is, and uh, I don't think many of us are going to have an impact there. Uh, overall, uh, you can see it uh, manifest itself every day in the stock market. Um, we've seen continued uh, declines in the large tech players uh, globally um, on the public markets, but that has also followed through into the private markets where uh, multiples compression has um, continues to this very day. Um, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. It doesn't look like there are any um, positive signals that that's going to turn around, at least in the short term. Um, if you look at it where we were uh, over the last couple of years, obviously multiples were at extremely all-time highs, extreme all-time highs, which did not necessarily make sense. Where things are right now, we are at just around long-term averages for tech multiples. So I don't think we're at a, at a place which is uh, necessarily very different from where uh, things should be. Now, uh, what does that look like? What does that look like for... Um, companies like us, companies in our sector, obviously coming off of the highs of last year as well, where you may have raised at significantly higher valuations, you're not going to see that level of uh, investor interest. You're not going to see those valuations uh, maintained. And we've seen that play out with some of our global comps um, in the buy now, pay later uh, space, but also outside of pure buy now, pay later. Right? Uh, so across the board, within, uh, within tech, within fintech more specifically, and within buy now, pay later even more specifically, these multiples have compressed and we've seen um, you know, uh, companies lose 75 to 10, 95 percent of their value, value sure. in um, over a six month period. Um, so that's not great. Um, having said that, right, there is probably um, clear rationale why that is the case in, ma in ma many cases. Again, the, the fact of the matter is a lot of these companies were building and growing the, their businesses very unsustainably. The valuations that they got, again, were not necessarily realistic. Um, and so there was a moment of needing to come back to earth. Um, 
uh, and and if you're in a in, if you are in a position of growing at any cost, which I think the large large majority of these companies were, um, then that this world is very different and and that no longer uh, plays out well so you're going to have to uh, completely uh, refocus and retune your business to focus on profitability versus growth um, and so you know uh, where where we've seen this um, play out in a positive way is is companies that have uh, from the very early days uh, focused on growth, uh, they don't really need to go back and, and uh, access capital because um, they built a business that is sustainable, they have uh, a sufficient war chests of, of cash within their businesses, and they can wait it out during this time where things have not played out as, as nicely as these companies that have had to go back into the market and raise at any valuation uh, in order to get capital that at least keeps the company afloat um, in the short term. Uh, so, so just hold that thought. Yeah. So that's valuation side of it, right? It, let's get to a more operational mm, implications, mm. right? Rising interest rates, yep. right? In a, in a business where the margins are tight, thin, yep. tight um, and, and it's a hard business to make mm-hmm, work. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, you have retailers who will want to push something like BNPL because they want to keep consumers coming back, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right, which works positively. Um, You also have, I guess, consumers who are wanting to manage their expenses more smartly and therefore their cash flow better, which again might work to your benefit. And then there's the fear that there are people who are you know, going to lose jobs yeah, potentially, yeah, yeah, which yeah. doesn't work well. At an operational level, how do you see this? This is more of an opportunity hurt. You know, wh- where where is the? It's a challenging business model. Uh, I don't think that differs from where it was two years ago. It's a very challenging business model to make work, and even more so with um, all the dynamics that you just mentioned. So, you know, my argument is, if you're building this business. Um, and the uh, viability of your business depends is so sensitive to movements and in, in, to uh, you know three hundred basis point movement in interest rates, then that's probably not a very solid ground that you're building your business on. But that yeah. must have been the case with a number of smaller players who actually took you know took out debt at sort of floating rates. So I think if you're building your again if you're building your business with that level of sensitivity, then you built the business the wrong way. Right. Um, you need to build in that level of buffer. And you know, none of us predicted the uh, the movement in interest rates over the last few months, uh, over the last uh, nine months, obviously. But what you can predict is, is that there will be some sort of volatility, right? Uh, you cannot have that level of certainty over that period of time and expect that that was going to continue uh, to be the case. So um, what I'm trying to say over here is um, you want to build in as much buffer into your business as possible. And the better businesses have done that. The businesses that haven't been able to do this in in a good way have actually suffered, right? Because when uh, you go from profitable to highly unprofitable because interest rates have moved up by 300 basis points, then you've probably done something wrong along the uh, along the way. You've probably overinvested in growth. You've overinvested in or un, uh, provided um, unsustainable pricing in the market. Um, subsidization, which has been the case, which we've seen across the board. Subsi- subsidizing um, uh, merchant access and subsidizing consumer growth. Right, there's a lot of factors that contribute to an unviable business or an unsustainable business model, and some movement in some of these external factors is obviously going to make that. Uh, even more pronounced. So, um, you know, it needs to be, uh, uh, the way we look at it is it is a big picture. You need to have all these various moving parts harmoni- uh, moving in, in harmony. Otherwise, you're going to actually suffer. But, but let me give you the other side. Uh, yeah. Don't do you have merchants clamoring down and beating your door down saying, come on board, sign us up? Uh, are you seeing a, a, a swathe of new merchants come on board? saying that we won't be in PL right now? So the demand has never been better. Right. Um, we, I think that's 
largely driven by consumer demand as well. So it, it is a very nice flywheel that you have going where consumers want it, they go to the merchants and the merchants uh, come, come uh, to us and ask for it. Um, I think what we saw last year versus where we're seeing this year is um, in markets where, in times where uh, capital is cheap, your competition is able to offer extremely unsustainable pricing mm-hmm. and the merchants will demand that because they, they know that they can. In a market like this, that has clearly changed because competition has to become a bit more rational. You know, the 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 broad so landscape. So the commercial discussions with the merchants become they easier. Changed. They bec- they become a lot easier. I think uh, driven by two factors is is they understand the model a bit better. They understand the broader dynamics and and and, and the macro environment. But also there is the less pressure from irrational competition. Okay, so so then that begs the question: What happens to you know the if I may call them the tier three tier two players? Um, who were, I guess, at the more early stage of their development, um, uh, you know, and might not have the the necessary yeah. runway. Uh, what happens to them over it's the next tough. couple of years? It's, it'll be very. T- it, it, it has been tough, and it'll get. It'll only get tougher um, because access to debt is going to be even more difficult. So, would guys like you look to buy out some of these guys, or it's not worth it? Not necessarily. I guess the question that we would ask ourselves is: is what are we buying? Um, uh, are you buying merchant access? You can get merchant access by going out and signing a deal with a merchant. Um, uh, I think I think where some of some of uh, some M and A has happened in the past is around uh, new market access, i.e., going to new geographies and so on. That could be interesting, but it's not something that we're too excited about ourselves. Uh, I think the the opportunity is very clear in the GCC and, and Egyptian markets that we're in. Um, but yeah, it, it's going to get very very tough for some of the tier three, uh, tier two, three, four players. Because access to capital is just going to get a lot more challenging. Switching topics, right? Um, BNPL, it, it's it's a very emotive topic, right? You, you've had headlines such as uh, you can love BNPL, you can hate BNPL, you can't ignore it. Um, why is it occupying so much mind space, right? And why is there so much, if I may go as far as sort of venomous yeah. anti-rhetoric regarding BNPL? It's a 200-year, if not a 500-year-old concept, yeah, yeah. which has existed. Why is it upsetting so many people? I think I think I go back to my initial point where there was excess attention um, on the sector early early on because everyone was raising such significant amounts of capital, um, and that excess attention just brings with it, um, you know, a lot a lot of negative uh, feelings. I think, you know, there is. In my cynical view, there is probably also a few, uh, a few, uh, you know, opponents that are, you know, uh, bank lobbyists. There are a few very loud idiots in on on Australian uh, LinkedIn that that you know, it's it's funny, uh, June, right? Like the the amount of time sp- they spend talking about how insignificant BNPL is. It's fairly significant, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> right? you could tell me that. Yeah. So yeah. you know, if if you're spending every moment of your LinkedIn uh, uh, time talking about how insignificant this is, then you're you're probably doing. I, you know, there's there's questions to be asked. Um, so what I would say is, I think the attention that it got was excessive. Um, it's a it's a very attractive model, uh, just like many other financing models or, or payment models out there. Um, I don't think it requires that level of attention. Um, you know, it's a difficult model to make work, and that's where we're spending a lot of our time. But you cannot say that the, there is no value in this product, right? There is real value that we see, um, you know, every day by the the sheer you know, volume of customers that that swear by this, right? Like they're yeah, so the take up rates are take up rates are incredible, right? And merchants and, love it. And merchants love it. Uh, the consumers, you know, we're seeing adoption of close to 30 to 40% on any merchant that we launch with, right? Um, compared to uh, any other payment method in the market, this is, uh, the, the, the speed at which we got there is pretty incredible, right? In a, in a two-year period to become the first or, or second largest payment method on any e-commerce player, um, that just says that this consumer really values this product. And so you can't just sit there and say that BNPL is, is, um, you know, is evil 
um, you know, the customers are not that, are, are not stupid, right? Customers know what they're going in for. Yes, uh, you know, there needs to be um, a certain level of education for certain types of customers, but it is a fairly simple product. Um, uh, and, and there's not much, you're, you're not going to go very far by trying to tr trick the consumer and trying to, uh, trying to uh, you know, slip in uh, terms and conditions that customers are not going to pick on. No, so so uh, you know where I sit on this. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of the viewers would know where I sit on this. Uh, I've actually been definitely on the supportive side. Like like any other thing which is in its nascency, it's going to have uh, certain sort of chinks in the armor sure. which need to be corrected. Um, I think partly will be corrected by regulation, partly will be corrected by the fact that players like yourselves and others will mature. Uh, I think partly it will be corrected by the fact that consumers will become more aware. Yeah. I think there's, there is a Listen, responsibility. And if we, and if we don't do the right thing, yeah. we go away, right? Exactly. If, if, we, if we try to outsmart the customer, if we try to outsmart the merchant, uh, if, uh, if we're doing things that are unethical, then we shouldn't be allowed to continue to be in business. And, and sooner or later, you'll be found out. So I think uh, what we're very clear on is that there is real value to the customer in the form of free installments at checkout. Um, there is no reason for you as a consumer um, not to uh, see value in that, and, and, and the consumers clearly do. Um, and as long as we're able to deliver on that value, um, you know, uh, there is a lot more that we can do. All right, so 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 take up rates. That's very interesting. I think you said 30%, right, with merchants, right? Um, um, let's take the UAE. I think Saudi is a slightly different market because credit card penetration is much lower. Yeah. Saudi, uh, UAE, the penetration rates are higher. One of the interesting discussions uh, which keeps coming up, and actually the statement keeps coming up, is BNPL a credit card killer? So is it? I don't think we're a credit card killer per se, uh, but if you're offering a shitty product, then you probably don't deserve to remain in business. And, and you know, the, the simple way of saying this is if your credit card is going to be completely uh, opaque to the customer, if you're going to be charging um, uh, you know, unknown fees um, and, and revolving interest and um, you know, all the bad things that people hate about credit cards, then you're probably going to dis be displaced over time, and if it's not by BNPL, it's probably by another form of product and another. Uh, Come on, credit card's been around since 1950. Yeah, and I think listen, there's been a lot of innovation. There's been a lot of improvement. Uh, uh, well, yes, but, but okay. at the end of the day, I think yeah, a lot of a lot of what people hate about credit cards still exists today. Yeah, um, here here specifically in this region, yeah, I think the APR rates are prohibited, and that and that's the thing. And and credit cards, in order for credit card businesses to make sense and to flourish. They need people to revolve. They need people to miss payments. And I don't think that's a good business. I, I, I think if you prey on the failure of your customers, uh, your customers are always going to be looking for alternatives. And, and for the first time, a real viable alternative comes in in the form of buy now, pay later. And you see customers moving uh, towards that at, at, at massive uh, scale and massive speed. So, um, you know, are we out there looking to destroy credit cards? I think the answer is no. But are they making our lives a lot easier um, by offering shitty, shitty products? And yeah, I, I think that's. Uh, um, but that's then, the case. It, then it kind of begs the question here, right? So are you really winning over the credit card customer, or are you are you actually providing product to a customer who would have typically never? either gotten a credit card uh, or would have applied for it? So there's a large portion of consumers that are very actively staying away from getting a credit card, right? Yeah. The, 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 uh, the younger, more savvy consumer today is actively not going out and applying for a credit card because that process um, in itself is very painful, uh, but also um, the repercussions uh, of missing payments on credit cards and just the lack of clarity and transparency within that business model keeps those customers away. Um, and so, yeah, we are providing an alternative to these consumers, uh, but also we, you are going to see more and more a typical credit card consumer that is not happy with the offering that they're getting from their bank or whoever else it is looking for alternatives 
and and were there uh, to fill that gap. Uh, you know, I, I'll 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 go on record. In my view, I think uh, credit cards will have a place going forward. Right. Sure. I, I don't think BNPL is going to replace it. I think there's a whole ecosystem of products which are coming up. Right. Real time payments with a, you know, with, with, a, with a credit product on top could actually pose a greater risk to credit cards yep. than yep. BNPL. Yep. Again, and, and the second aspect is I do feel uncomfortable. Uh, and maybe this is just me in the minority that someone is allowed to use their credit card mm -hmm. to repay a buy now, sure. pay later yeah. outstanding. I'll buy that. And for obvious reasons, right? Because I'm not suggesting that everybody is malicious, but most people actually don't know what they're getting themselves into before they get themselves into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and actually, you know, while the consumer is incre increasingly aware, there is a degree of naivety out there too, which exists in terms of people actually understanding credit cards. I think credit yeah, cards yeah. are one of the most opaque products out there. Absolutely. Right? We did some analysis, uh, um, you know, for the firm I work with, where we looked at what is the outstanding uh, amount or how penalized a customer gets if they actually miss three BNPL transactions versus three credit card, sure. and the numbers are disproportionately higher in terms of credit card transactions. Yep. So yep. I do think there is a place for credit cards in the market going forward. Yeah, and, and the credit uh, card model requires people to revolve, right? That's how they make their money. Exactly. Uh, and especially in a market like here where the average APRs are hovering around 40%. Exactly, right? And for the BNPL uh, model, that is actually the exact opposite of what we prefer, right? We want people to people pay, on, pay time on time because our risk appetites are significantly smaller than yeah. a bank, right? Our funding... And making, and making a 15 dirham kicker on a late payment. And that's it. it. It is capped at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. So, uh, so that's not... The model is not to make money off of late fees. We want people to pay on time. Credit card companies prefer that that's not the case, right? They prefer people to revolve because that's where the money is. So now you're not a banker. You've never been a banker, but I'm yeah. sure you have a lot of banker friends. Right. So, so what's the chap? What's the next chapter with banks and BNPL players? We've seen one move in the market already. Yeah. Right. With uh, a fairly large bank and one of your peers, uh, you know, get together in a collaboration. Sure. How do you see banks play? So, what are the different playbooks the banks are going to apply? To, to sort of either get onto the bandwagon of BNPL or combat the fear yeah. of BNPL? I mean, I, I, I'm not here to speak on behalf of the banks. I, you know, I think there's many ways in which we can work together. One of the ways that we work with banks today is, is you know, they, they provide uh, sources of capital for us. And, um, you know, banks, uh, by definition, have extremely cheap access to capital, um, and that's capital that we could benefit from. Um, so if, if we're giving them ways in which they can deploy it, um, and we and, and they make money off of that, then then that's a very simple and and uh, effective partnership that we can continue uh, we can see continuing to scale. You know, do we see ourselves providing this product to banks? Probably not. Right? We don't want to create competition um, or uh, additional competition in the market. Um, but as as far as we can continue to play alongside each other, that's something we're happy with. And and are they coming to the party? So well, yeah. I guess, again, when you look back two years ago, when BNPL was uh, the hottest topic on everyone's, uh, on, on every table, you'd hear bankers talk about it, you'd hear retailers talk about it. That's clearly not the case anymore, right? So um, when, when money was free, it was exciting to kind of think about, uh, you know, this, this new hot sector that everyone can get into. Um, today, the reality is very different. People realize that it is a model that is very difficult to make work. Um, and you just don't hear that chatter anymore. Right? No, but you did. So, so Apple wanted to launch, then I think stop. I don't know if it's launched since then. They have launched, yeah. They have launched since then, right? Um, Apple is not maybe a quintessential retailer. So what's different about Apple and why wouldn't we see others follow Apple's? Suit? I would say uh, Apple's a retailer. Apple's a payments company and, and as such, I think you know, they're, they're broadening their uh, offering. They have a very significant balance sheet. I don't think you can say that about most uh, retailers in the market. Um, you know, if you are a retailer that is building out a broader financial services offering, then maybe, right? But if you're a retailer that's looking at providing financing, then you're much better off giving it to someone that just, you know, a, a, a business that uh, sees this as a core focus of, of theirs. You know, the, uh, the risk embedded in 
uh, lending is not insignificant. That's why um, you know up until very recently it was only banks and a few banks that uh, it was only banks that were doing this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I I don't think that that's uh, necessarily the case anymore. It ha- the the chatter has definitely changed over the last uh, 12 months. Here's my hypothesis on on retailers, non-FIs regarding BNPL, right? Uh, uh, you might choose to disagree with me. Uh, a lot of people do. Uh, but um, I, I think, uh, I guess this needs to play out before, you know, mm. uh, I, I, either parties or either camps are proven right or wrong. So here are my three sort of uh, hypotheses. One is, any retailer of these of significant size will start to offer multiple BNPL uh, mm-hmm. uh, options on checkout. Uh, I think those single exclusive relationships, which might have existed over the last couple of years, uh, on the basis of uh, uh, sharing data, building a better relationship, having better consistent journeys, I think will 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 not prevail over the fact that retailers will want to give mm-hmm, a choice. Mm-hmm. Second, right? I think some retailers will take a, a bigger leap of faith uh, and they will introduce their own BNPL offering. Mm. Now, when I use the word own, I don't necessarily mean that it would be built by them on their balance sheet. There could be white label deals. There could be gray label deals. There could be joint ventures. There could be possibly an outsourcing of their balance sheet to whoever is willing to come on board, Mm. right? And the third one, which actually interests me a lot, is that we are obviously seeing a growth in platform-based businesses, right? And these platform-based businesses tend to be fanatical about controlling customer journeys, holding to as much customer data that they want to. And I think a lot of them are actually seeing the wider fintech opportunity as a natural extension of their business model, yeah. right? Whether they go all out or whether they do it selectively, that depends on, on I guess, the, which platform you are in, right? And, and I think nearly all of them will look at alternative financing, mm-hmm. right? Uh, both on the B2B and B2C side and BNP will become part of it. Your views and my three statements. Um, so number one, I think is, is, uh, I'll answer one and, and then two and three, I would probably put together. One is on, um, these, uh, these, plat- these merchants, uh, choosing more than one, uh, BNPL. I think that's fine. You want to give your customer choice, uh, like on what I would argue is, is not to give the customer too much choice because then it just, you know, it becomes confusing. The overall experience is just not as smooth. Uh, and, and seamless but what does a merchant choice. lose by giving choice? You could give some choice. That's what I'm saying. So right. uh, I don't think they lose anything by giving choice. And okay. at the end of the day, if you want to put in one or two uh, BNPLs, I think that's totally uh, fine and, and totally reasonable. Um, and and then you leave that choice to the consumer on, on you know, where they feel more comfortable, where that um, relationship might exist in the past as well. And um, so, you know, we're not against that. Uh, I don't think we would, I don't think it's the right uh, argument for us to make to a merchant to um, ask them to do otherwise. Um, I think it's in, fully in their right uh, to choose to uh, work with more than one uh, BNPL. Um, I think it is important then to assess. Uh, the merits and the performance of these BNPLs once they are on that platform, because what you don't want to do is is have two sitting next to each other, one of which performs significantly better at the detriment um, of uh, the customer experience on uh, on the other one. Um, on two and three, I think it's uh, at the end of the day, if you look at uh, the world's most successful retail brands, none of these guys have built out their own offerings. Amazon hasn't. Walmart hasn't. Oh, Walmart uh, has, no? Well, they're doing it with a the firm. They're, they're doing it with a firm. Yeah. Right? And uh, Shopify as a platform as well has partnered with a firm. Um, uh, my, my view here is, is very simple. Um, BNPL credit lending is a very complex product. We've seen time and time again how um, complex that is with uh, many uh, businesses um, underperforming over the last uh, year or so. Um, and I think it's it's quite a stretch to expect a retailer to do this well or to do this better than uh, um, someone who's fully focused on this as their core business. Um, and so I don't, I don't see this happening. We haven't seen it happen in the past. 
And I would say the the uh, possibility of this happening in the future is much less than it could have been over the last 12 months. Right. So you don't think they're just feeling it out, learning on your expense? I think if, if, if you can give the pain and the complexity to somebody else to work with and pay a small premium on that, um, then it's, you're much better off. Let's talk about the, you know, the biggest sort of question mark, which is around regulation, mm -hmm. right? We're starting to see some soft regulation. Um, you know, obviously Saudi already has certain markers yep. in the sand in terms of what you guys within the sandbox are allowed to do and not allowed to do. Uh, and Singapore actually took that uh, a step further with self-regulation, which if you remember last year, uh, or I think even longer when I was still uh, part of the MENA Fintech Association, it was something I was trying to prophesy sure. with a bunch yeah. of you guys, right? Where do you see regulation heading? How soon do you see it coming? Um, and and you know uh, you know what are the implications? Yeah. Uh, so and in Saudi, as you said, regulation is uh, is already there. It's been there for a while, and I think uh, I think that's the right approach. And in, in the UAE, it's also coming. Um, uh, this, just like any other consumer uh, financial services offering, is is a product that needs to be regulated. Um, where our discussions have been with the regulators in both markets is around just putting together regulation that is commensurate with the risk. Right? At the end of the day, again, the ticket sizes are very small. The consumer credit risk is relatively limited. Um, and the burden on consumers if they end up missing payments is also very, very limited. Right? So as long as that is taken into, into account, this is definitely a product that needs to be regulated, right? We need to make sure that we're, uh, uh, we're doing the right things for the consumer, we're, we're uh, lending within our means, consumers are borrowing within their means. Um, all of that is uh, stuff that nobody's really gonna argue against, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, so uh, where we are today is I think um, very much in line with where many of the other global markets have started to move uh, towards some sort of regulation. Um, largely around affordability, uh, lending practices, and, and advertising practices as well. Okay, so so regulation comes, uh, one of the positive impacts could be your cost of borrowing potentially goes down, right? Um, because lenders might feel a little bit more comfortable about what's what's going on, but compliance and regulatory costs go up, mm -hmm. right? So if you're a subscale player, it actually becomes quite hard yep. to play. Um, that is definitely a fear that I do see. I want to talk about evolution, right? Mm. Uh, my view uh, uh, is that pure BNPL, the economics just don't add up on its own, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it runs the risk of going from a whole category to a product to possibly becoming a feature, right? That's not the debate I want to have sure, with yeah. you. Um, but before I get into evolution and where and how you see different playbooks emerge, and we're seeing some globally, talk to us a little bit about Klarna because that really did not help the whole BNPL yeah, yeah. Uh, picture. No, it didn't. Uh, right, and and um, I guess if you look, my my strong view is uh, BNPL is is very much a local business. You need to have a local understanding, a local focus. Uh, Local understanding of of the uh, of the consumer, of the merchant base, of the uh, uh, credit risk on the consumer side, and and Klarna had it going well for itself in in its core markets. Right, uh, it's really only when it went um, into a market that was foreign to it, um, seeking growth at all costs, is when it started to hurt. Right, um, this is for probably the fourth time I've said today, a, a uh, low margin business, right? And going out and subsidizing uh, transactions on the consumer side, subsidizing integrations on the merchant side, um, and taking uh, uh, you know, uh, excessive risk on the consumers will only end up with one thing, which is where, where Klarna um, has been over the last uh, year or so. And that hasn't bode well for, uh, for the product. Um, but more so as well, I, I go back to the uh, my one of my opening uh, points, which is, does the U.S. consumer really need a fourth or fifth credit card, right? If you look at uh, buy now pay later as an additional source of credit, where customers have that access and they're using BNPL as that extension on top of their second or third credit card, you're really ending up 
uh, providing credit to a customer that is subprime in a way, right? They've maxed out everything else that they have, and now they're going to buy now, pay later as, uh, as an additional source of credit. In a market like this, where the consumer um, simply does not have a, that access, we're lending to a much better quality consumer. Interesting perspective on, on, on Klarna in the US, right? Uh, I, I guess, you know, it's a topic which I think different people will have different opinions sure. on. Uh, but I think to an extent, I do I do buy into what you're saying, which is why I think we've seen buy, buy now, pay later, see some hyper growth in markets like India where credit penetration is low, right? But let's switch, well, I'm not saying let's switch topics, but let's extend that topic, right? The way I see Klarna, and I am a big fan of Klarna in the way that they've gone about doing things themselves uh, and the way they've positioned themselves in the market. Uh, my view, my hypothesis is that in two to three years' time, right, Klarna is not going to be a BNPL player, right? right? In 2021, they generated something like 300 million odd clicks for their retailers. I see them position themselves as a marketplace, right? As a place where people will want to come and shop and embedded within that experience will be financial products. Uh, and buy now, pay later and pause financing yep. will be a couple of those, right? Question is what playbooks do you see emerging in this market? Because I for one am convinced and sure you'll disagree with me or maybe you won't is that pure play buy now pay later economically or on the unit unit economics doesn't sort of make sense mm. because uh, even if you keep, keep scaling it doesn't sort of add that much incremental to the bottom line yeah so what sort of playbooks do you see emerging yeah so that's on 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 Klarna specifically i mean it's definitely a company that we look up to very highly, right? Like what they've done is is pretty incredible. Obviously, uh, there there were a few kind of mishaps along the way um, in on on the road to hyperscale, um, uh, but what they've built and what they continue to build is is pretty impressive. Um, uh, and there's a lot that we can learn from them, and we continue to uh, learn from them uh, as as they scale. Now. Uh, you know their their move towards um, you know, marketplace and becoming a shopping platform is is something that uh, we're actually quite uh, well on on the path towards. Uh, you know, in the past year, we've generated something around fifty million clicks to uh, the merchants that we work with uh, across, across the GCC, right? And it's it's something that our our merchant partners see a lot of value in uh, today. Um, you know, a lot of our customers, a large portion of our customers, actually start their shopping. Uh, journey on the Tabby app rather than uh, than on the merchant side, and it's something that we see a lot of promise in. Uh, but then on your point on on where does this model evolve? Uh, listen, BNPL economics work; they're just very challenging to make work. Um, mm -hmm. Right? Uh, uh, you know, we've we're we've managed to make it work. We've managed to scale this business with uh, the tight margin uh, margins that this business uh, comes with. Uh, but it's not that straightforward, um, and and so you can have a pure play BNPL, but in a market like this one, where we believe the opportunity is significantly broader than just a, a, a single product, um, there's a lot more that we can do, and that's that's basically what we're um, spending the next. Few I want to years. come back to that at the, at the end. Uh, yeah. I do want to hear about as much as you'd like to share sure, sure. about the evolution. Yeah, right. but you know, uh, if you, if you look at some, where some of the other players are headed, it, it, it is you know they think about obviously we think about a lot of the same things, right? Uh, becoming a marketplace, uh, um, you know, providing immediate payments, providing single click checkout, uh, providing merchant lending. We've seen a whole gamut of of uh, products being positioned out from from some of these players. Some of them make sense, some of them less so. Um, I think it is important to assess the market that you're operating within and where the gaps are, um, and then who your consumer and who your merchants are, and then assess accordingly. Right? Yeah, and so I, I think it's kind of early days. I, I, so I do agree with you in the market. I have seen a number one number of players go down this marketplace route, yeah. right? And yet to see anyone actually make a substantial move in uh, into a product category which is adjacent. Now, you can argue one of your competitors 
is entering into the pause financing space mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. they've got a banking partnership, yep. so they're able to leverage the license of the bank. Uh, but I, I'm yet to see any BNPL player, unless you correct me, which is getting into merchant funding, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, or other payment products as such, yep. or anything to do with savings, uh, which you could argue could work very well in a, in a BNPL context. In any case, uh, I talk theoretically. Uh, a lot of these international players, do you think they're going to enter the local market? A year ago, two years ago, that was the case. Everyone was looking at this market. Everyone was looking at you know planting flags in, in, in various markets. We see how that has played out uh, for many players, uh, right? Zip is one example. Uh, Klarna is another. Um, where those, uh, those journeys haven't been as uh, straightforward as, as they could have been, right? In in the environment that we had two years ago, uh, right? So I think I think where things are today, um, there's clearly not enough value in planting flags just for the sake of being in multiple markets. There needs to be some sort of synergy uh, that is realized by operating across markets, right? The way we look at it is, is there a consumer overlap? Is there a merchant overlap? Um, you know, are there are there uh, regulatory uh, synergies to be uh, to be realized? But to go and set up shop in a completely different market um, with what is very much a local product, I think brings on challenges that are not necessary. Right? If you're doing, uh, if you're you know, branching out into different products outside of BNPL, then maybe. But uh, but pure BNPL. Um, setting up shop across multiple markets with with very little uh, synergistic overlap, I don't think makes sense. Last segment of our discussion today. Mm. Everything's about Tabby now. We just spoke about your uh, offline card, which you launched earlier in the year, right? Um, My understanding is it is uh, what you call a restricted loop card, Mm. i.e. it only works with the merchants who are contracted with you, Yep. right? First question, is that how it's always going to be? Absolutely not. Uh, and it's, that's kind of phase one of the card okay. um, and how we wanted to take it to market. So I'll, 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 I'll let you keep that as a surprise to us whenever mm-hmm. you decide to do something else with it. But talk to us about, you know, uh, what's the traction been um, uh, among not just the consumers, but also the merchants for this offline product, right? Um What's been the relative growth rate uh, for the offline product compared to? Obviously, it's a smaller base. Yeah, so I'm assuming yep. you're seeing, but you know, I think you could give me a more sort of weighted answer on mm. that. Um, um, are merchant commissions better uh, mm. on the offline world uh, or not? So they should be the same. It's the same product. Um, it's the same kind of uh, value prop for the merchant for the consumer. So uh, generally, um, the commissions are equal. Between online, what and about traction? And traction has been pretty incredible. Uh, we did not, we did not expect this level of traction. We obviously expected, just given the fact that most retail happen, happens offline in this market, that there would be some uh, level of traction that would grow over time. Um, but I think the customer, uh, and especially just given the way that we've launched this, we've launched this to customers that know our product, they are existing Tabby users. Um, and so they, these uh, consumers were looking to extend their relationship with us and extend that uh, experience uh, into the offline space where they also spend a, a decent amount of their time. Um, you know, some of the numbers that we, we can share is um, the card, uh, the number of cards we've issued in the last three months um, since the pro- program has been live is bigger than any other bank uh, um, issuance in the UAE. Okay. Um, within that period of time, right? And so, uh, you know, we're aware of uh, what a typical bank issues in terms of uh, number of cards. Obviously, these uh, these banks have existing customer bases and so on. Um, Is that a comparison against credit cards, debit cards? Credit cards. Credit cards. Credit cards yeah. is how we would look at it. Um, but yeah, so the traction has been pretty incredible. Uh, the usage in store has been very strong. Um, I think it's just down to the fact that it is a very... A seamless experience for the customer. Very few uh, card programs or cards are uh, issued completely digitally within uh, within an app, um, tokenized on uh, wallets, 
all within a 30 second uh, time frame yep. um, in the region. And I think that uh, it's something that the team has done an, an excellent job at. No, and, and I, you know, my view here is actually uh, it potentially opens an entire ecosystem of opportunities that could be built around this product, right? Mm -hmm. So it is a continu it, it, it gives you the continuity of online, offline, you know, call it whatever you want to call it. Yeah, uh, but you can build commerce. a platform around the card. Yeah, yeah, you could you could build a whole sort of sense of offering around it. Um, what are you doing about customer awareness? So is it, is it just in app um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, or or is it that simple to use? Um, our primary focus has actually been with our partners. Uh, right. So we work very closely with uh, our partner merchants uh, to educate the customer within their stores. Uh, and they obviously use it as a uh, mechanism in which, in order to kind of, uh, improve conversion, uh, increase sales, drive some sort of traffic. But we're also doing a lot of that on our app as well. Uh, so the issuance happens on our app. Um, there is a very clear uh, directory for uh, the customers to discover where uh, this card is accepted and therefore that uh, ends up driving that traffic to our, our merchant partner. So it, it is a very nice um, uh, you know, two-way dialogue that's happening between us and the merchants to drive uh, consumers to their stores. I've taken a lot of your time. I'm not going to ask the question. I guess everybody wants to hear from you. You don't have to spill you know, your, the secrets out or give us your playbook. But you know what are going to be the four or five thematic uh, I guess bets mm -hmm. that you're going to make as tabby for the for the near future, yeah. and I, I'm only interested in the next 24 months. Yeah. So the what what is clear is the opportunity is much much broader than just buy now pay later, right? As again a checkout button on on or a payment method on checkout. Um, uh, so we're the plan uh, for us um, is basically we're going to spend a lot more time uh, on offline. Um, we've started that with uh, the foray into the card product, uh, and we really want to invest in growing uh, our presence there. As you know, over 90% of retail in the region still happens offline, and, and yeah. that's an opportunity that we, next we can't ignore. Yeah. Right? Um, there is a lot more that we believe we can do and should do on the customer education side, um, and so um, you know, there will be products uh, and additional features around that. Um, on you know, we've just recently entered Egypt. Uh, we believe that there that is a market with you know, with a lot of its challenges uh, that we know of is a market that has incredibly high potential going forward uh, that we'd like to be able to leverage, but leverage the right way. Right? It's not necessarily a, a the similar playbook that we uh, had in uh, the UAE and Saudi, which is e-commerce first. Not, you're not the only one who said that. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and then and and then uh, you know uh, really kind of double down on uh, our platform play uh, for our merchant partners. Right, there is um, a lot that our customers are coming back to us for, um, and we believe that there is um, uh, you know a bro much broader opportunity uh, from a product perspective than just pure buy now pay later um, uh, for us as a business. Hossa, I want to thank you. Thanks for taking our time. It's late on a Friday evening. I'm keeping you away from your family, but we're not yet done. I have right. one last question, right? And it's not a question for the for the show, but well, it is a question for the show, but but a very different type of audience who doesn't look at the show. Uh, but my intention is to reach out to them in a different ways. So you're not the only one answering this question. Every single guest okay. who's going to sit on that couch is uh, going to answer this question. Um, in the next 30 to 60 seconds, mm -hmm. in your words, try and explain what buy now, pay later means to an audience of 8 to 12-year-olds. Nice. All right. So, uh, so honey, if you have a, uh, a Lego that you want to buy, uh, and that Lego costs your mommy and daddy 100 dirhams, you can now buy this Lego for 25 dirhams every month. Um, and that's all you, your mommy and daddy pay. Uh, much easier than spending 100 dirhams in one go, especially if your pocket money is a lot less than that. So, so they, should, they should be buying it over four installments of 25 dirhams. Exactly. So you're going to make life for the mommies and daddies harder. Much easier, right? <laughs> much, much easier.
<laughs> except the demand is going to go up <laughs> all of a sudden. Well, that that's great. Thank you. I I, I will make sure that that is packaged, and I I will take my comment off it. Uh, but no, Zam, pleasure to meet you as always. Uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch again. Um, uh, and you know, uh, you're part of a very special episode for me. I never thought I would make it through three episodes of season one, <laughs> leave alone launch a second season. You've done an itself. amazing job, man. Right, no, I appreciate that. Thanks for all the support. Thank and you. The, and the, and, the, and the, the good words from you. So, guys, that's the end of the first episode of the second season. I had Hussam Arab, or who I have now named Mr. BNPL. I'm not sure he likes it, no. but, 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 you know, that's just the, the risk of, of coming in and sitting on, on my couch. Uh, I'd like to thank you. Uh, uh, we're going to show or air an episode every week. Um, so so we're launching, uh, well, you're seeing this episode today is the 10th of Jan, um, and the next episode will be on the 17th. So with that, goodbye and thank you.